Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you all here. Look at all that chatter. That's, that's great to hear joyful chatter as we come into service. Thank you all so much for being here. You know there are a lot of people to be praying for. Carol Rosero has a, uh, some, discovered something that uh, in medical, in medicine, that she needs some help with, so I'll be praying for her. Um, Earl, you know, I've been, I think you all know, maybe... I found I discovered that I very often push the the home button instead of the send button when I'm sending out texts and and emails. So if you didn't get it, it's because I didn't push the send button. Uh, so I will try to do better. This week has been one kind of. It feels like it's been a year this week. Uh, I wasn't even in in the pulpit last week, and I still feel like I had just preached uh, two, ten times. Uh, John, thanks for helping us out and for, for taking over last weekend. Uh, the great sermon on the family, so thank you for doing that. And uh, thank you for you being here and running things. And um, We have some prayers to pray, so why don't we do that right now? Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, thank you so much for the wonderful reception that Alicia had yesterday. And I pray that you would bless each one that's here, Father God. Fill us with love and and, uh, peace and joy with each other. And thank you for the time that we have together. Help us to live to glorify you. And Father, uh, help this church to grow. Send us laborers into this field, Father God. It's a tough field to work in. Uh, We need to break up the soil. We need to... Uh, touch people's hearts. There are atheists, there are Buddhists, there are Islams, uh, Muslims, there are Hindus, all uh, distracted from you by their beliefs. We pray that you would help us to reach out and touch and show love to every one of them. And Father, we pray that you would be with us today as we worship. Help us to put aside all our needs and our problems and just focus on you, knowing that you will take care of us as we do that. We pray for Earl and and Linda as they go through what they've been going through, the battles that they've been fighting. We pray for Joe Gray, uh, the battle that he is fighting. Father, that you would help him to um, help his body to adapt to the, the new liver and help that to go well and bring him back to his family safely. We pray for each one of the family, give them comfort as they wait for, um, for him to be able to get out. And Father, we pray that you would be with Carol and be with her as she has to deal with that medical issue that she has. Uh, we pray for Sandy and, and her healing. And Thank you so much that we have each other to, to lean on, help us to be good comfort to one another. And Father, we also think about um, you, the Ukraine, the Ukrainians. We pray that you would be with them as the bully nation Russia is, is trying to uh, capture and destroy that nation. They want it to be a part of them. So Father God, we pray that you would, in your sovereignty, hold them apart. And we pray that also that you would be with the... Um, Taiwan, as they're dealing with the problems of uh, the bully nation, China. And we pray, Father, that you would be in charge of that situation. And all the people who are streaming up through uh, South America to our uh, southern border, Father God, we pray that you would bring peace and comfort and calm to that whole situation. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. We lift you up today. Father, because there is no greater deed that we can do than glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's turn it over to the worship team. Let's think about the thousands of reasons we have to praise God. Let's celebrate his love for us. Oh, 
Give somebody a hug, a handshake, a holy kiss. Let them know that you are, you love the fact that they're here. <laughs> How's it going? It helps me. It's doing good? We're, we're going fine? It's <laughs> going. Oh, the joy, huh? The joy, sweet joy of candy. That's the thing. <laughs> what a wonderful occupation. <laughs> How you do it? Yes, are you feeling? Are you feeling okay? Hey, how are you guys doing? Nice to see you. Yes, yeah. missed you so much. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Welcome, it's good to see you. She'll say, well, the gift is okay. I would much rather have them there. But <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. And that's Everybody say, God bless. Bye. I will celebrate. Sing unto the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. I Yeah. 
not only are there a thousand reasons to praise God, we can praise God in every season of our lives. We can praise Him when things are going well, uh, and we can praise Him uh, when we're going through a desert. This is my prayer in the desert, and all that's within This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, the weakness or trial of pain. There is a faith root and more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. The weapon formed against me. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the battle, the triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and aware with Christ, so firm on his promise I'll stand. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. All of my life, in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall be made. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, when fever and providence go. I know I'm filled to be emptied again, the seed I received I will sow. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It was not long ago that I stood at this place. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm going to read the scriptures for this uh, morning communion meditation. In news media, there are two people. One will be the anchor in the television when you watch one will be the reporter whatever the reporter when the anchor asks him how is the situation so he tells because he will be seeing with his own eyes and he presents what was happening so the anchor the same message sometimes because of the advanced technology they will show with that clip and uh, that reporter will be uh, uh, shooting with his cameraman's help. So, however, we get the news. So the news in the scriptures and uh, 
an incident and this incident was presented in the gospels and in the book of uh, corinthians when this all were presented by the anchors in the corinthians and uh, mark and luke john did not mention anything that would have been very close observation of a reporter but matthew was there present and he has reported this incident the incident what we read now it's an occasion and and, uh, and it was a celebration because it happened at the time of festival once in a year they observe that festival that commemorates their freedom as we have 4th of july so that evening they were celebrating and uh, in that celebration there are elements on the table and uh, this celebration the incident what happened is pre presented to us in the 26th chapter and 26th verse of that chapter matthew while they were eating that means he is writing this because same thing as is written in mark and luke they were not present there but matthew was he is one of the disciples so whatever mark and uh, luke uh, and uh, paul presented in corinthians that was anchor's presentation but this is a reporter's presentation because he was in that room he has written what he observed so and he was present with jesus so he said jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it each and every uh, thing he observed and gave it to his disciples means us he must have put there saying take and eat this is my body then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins i tell you i will not drink of this fruit of the wine from now on until that day when i drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom this, this is what he heard with his own ears and he has seen with his own eyes what jesus did and there were elements and uh, he has compared those elements the bread which is broken it's an action the breaking of bread is breaking of his body which we see in the movies uh, like passion of christ it's unbearable but some people uh, seeing that movie they cried there what pain it would have been what an agony so he bore for us and uh, because of that we get a new life you know what when adam and eve in the garden of eden this god promised that they would die on that they, they were dead and with this we get a new life it is a new new generation so that is what the meaning of our commemoration they were celebrating uh, jews celebrated it as they passed from slavery in the egypt they have been freed and came into the freedom from that day that is the memory uh, uh, remembered as the, uh, celebrating the freedom so today when we take this we have born again we were dead in our sins they were dead almost in the egypt to be the slavery but they were freed 
So we are also freed to be born again and live for his glory. That is what. So we have one assurance that we are going to take this along with him in the presence of the Father. What a guarantee. What an assurance one day. Until, until then, he is not going to touch it again. What an assurance and a promise. So dear brothers and sisters, we have that opportunity. We, he has given us, and also he said, do this until I come back. He's going to come back. We are going to join him. And we are going to celebrate this along with the Father. So with that happiness and with that kind of assurance, let us participate in this. His broken body, he took the bread and broke it. And soon after that, he picked up that. There must have been water. There must have been many, any of the liquids there. But he picked up the grape juice. And he said, because, you know, once he made water into grape juice, water into wine. So that's why he picked up that because when he did that miracle that was the first miracle just Jesus did it is written so that same we are taking today the blood of Jesus shed for us so we have participated in this and we are thankful for everything that is done in our lives so let us You may be seated. I got my sword.
Do you ever forget to do something or not do something that you knew you were supposed to do? You know that honey list, guys, that you get from your wife that this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, and you put it off. Or, as children, when mom and dad say, uh, you need to take out the garbage or wash the dishes or make your bed, and you always find something else to do. You don't do it, you keep putting it off, what happens? Sometime a club comes down, doesn't it? And says, hey, you haven't done what I asked you to do. What's wrong with you? Well, today we have that situation. As we take a look at book, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 8, let's take a look at that together, and we'll meet uh, Deacon Phillips. Remember, Philip was one of those guys that was chosen to serve the tables of the Hellenistic Jews who weren't getting all the food that, or all the attention that the Hebrew Jews were getting, the Judean Jews were getting. So uh, he is now he's gone on from being a deacon into being what is called an evangelist, okay? And by the way, and we'll note this later on in the book of Acts, he is the only one, you know, evangelism is so important to the church, but he is the only one who is called an evangelist throughout all of the scripture that I can find anyway. If you find someone else, you let me know. But as, as far as I know, he's the only one that's been called an evangelist, which seems kind of strange since evangelism is so important. We may find out why uh, that is so as we look at uh, the book of Acts together. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, thank you so much for this time. Open up the word to us. Help us to understand the grand themes and the little things that you have for us to know and understand. Fill us with passion and compassion. Let us live out the words that you give us this day. Thank you for each one that's here us to live for you in Jesus name amen so we're in the book of Acts we've been going along we've been meeting the people and understanding that the whole thing is coming down from um, the the day of the resurrection right the the church began not the day of resurrection but 50 days later but Everything lays out so that the church does begin and that we are living. The, the, the church has made a difference in the world because of that one single day, that day that Jesus rose from the grave. It changed the lives of Peter, we've seen, and it changed the action of uh, what's happening in Jerusalem as people all around Jerusalem are accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and just having a great old time enjoying that celebration. Remember that uh, Jesus then went to heaven and he left some challenges for us. Let's take a look at the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, the 4th verse. Read that with me and then we'll go back and pick up all 40 verses again uh, through, through this as we meet Philip and what then the work that he has to do. Those, so read along with me please. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Let's do that again. Those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. Let's go back and uh, take a look at the whole thing. Because what's happening is God is breaking up the huddle. There was every Christian gathered in the book of, uh, in Jerusalem. That was the place to be. Let's read this and see. Uh, I'll read this and we'll catch it on. On that day, great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Great Commission Jesus gave them on the day that he went to heaven. And that great commission is Acts 1, verse 8. 
This is the key verse to the book of Acts, right? We said that as we read this uh, several weeks ago. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was the command that Jesus gave the apostles as he left for heaven. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's what you see. You can outline the book of uh, the book of Acts with that this one verse. You could say, okay, they were in Jerusalem, and yeah, because they were in Jerusalem, it spread out into Judea a little bit. And then you see right now books, uh, the book of the the eighth chapter that they now move into Samaria finally. And uh, then we see in verse in chapter 13 that they move into the entire, the ends of the earth is the plan. And you and I are still a part of that plan, reaching out in the ends of the earth. <sighs> so what we have is uh, there was Fortress Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, Peter got up and preached a great sermon that touched the hearts of many and 3,000 people were baptized and came to, the, came to the Lord and were baptized and enjoyed a fellowship together. They got together every day and they preached and they taught and they learned and they broke bread together. They had communion every day. They were just having a good old time. They were praying for each other, praying for the work, praying for all that stuff. And it was just a great time. It was the home of Christianity. And we see that going on and on and on. There was, uh, later on, there was, uh, within a year, there was another 5,000 that came to the Lord when uh, the, the um, beggar that was sitting at the door of, of the temple accepted, oh, was healed, and then they preached the gospel, and people came. And so we saw and that God not only did that, but he added to the church daily. And not only that, but it became, uh, after we saw the problem with the, with the uh, Hellenistic Jews, and the Judean Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the Judean-speaking Jews, uh, all who had come, the Greek-speaking Jews had all come from out of town and had stayed around. And this was six years later now. They have been in Jerusalem. It's the home of Christianity. Everybody thinks, oh, Christianity, if you want to be a Christian, go to Jerusalem. And you can hear some wonderful things and become a part of a great fellowship. And it became a very popular thing to do and a wonderful thing to do. And that was where the problem with Ananias and Sapphira came along. It was a popular thing to do. It wasn't a hard thing for them to do. They wanted to get involved with, you know, the church because it was an exciting and going thing. It was the thing to do. It was the home, the fortress Jerusalem, and everybody just was there. Wanted to be be a Christian, you came to Jerusalem. It was the home of Christianity, or actually called the way at the time, right? It was where they would, everyone would come and follow Jesus, who was the way. And that, so the early church was known as the way, not as Christian, Christians or Christian churches or anything. They were the way. <sighs> but, but then along comes Stephen. Stephen pushes into the Sanhedrin and gets into trouble and is stoned. Saul is there. A man named Saul is there. He's a young man. He has passion for uh, Judaism, and he's standing there, and he sees these people all. He says, I'll take your coats. I'll take your coats. Give me your coats, so you can go ahead and stone Stephen. So he did. So Saul was a part of that. And Saul was a part of the reason that the, the church became persecuted. The church hadn't done what Jesus had asked them to do, had it? The church hadn't started in Jerusalem and reached out to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Six years, it sat there being so happy with itself and following its own ways and doing what God told them to do in Jerusalem. And if it if someone in Judea caught a hold of it, that's fine. But they didn't go to Judea. They didn't go to Samaria. They just kind of stayed in their little huddle and let people come to them, which is a nice way to evangelize. I think that is one of the most powerful evangelistic 
tools when the members of the congregation love the congregation so much that they just have to bring their friends and their family. Come and be a part of our worship. You've never had worship like this. You've never loved the Lord like this. You've never heard the word like this. Come and be a part. And that makes the church grow. It really does. There's a good fellowship there. But God God had other plans for the church. He did not plan for it to stay in Jerusalem and just kind of ooze out into the, uh, into the surrounding area. His plan was that it actively gets out and does things. And so he had to have a persecution to get the church going. It's just like mom and dad who put a little bit of extra effort into pushing the child to make their bed or... Take out the garbage. If you don't do that, you're gonna, I'm going to take away your phone or something. So God was taking away the phone of those, Israelite, uh, those Jewish Christians. He said, you can't have this back until you start doing what you're going to do. He sent that persecution. So the Samaritan door was open. Now all of a sudden they said, oh, well, we were supposed to, or at least Philip said, well, we were supposed to go to Samaria. Why don't I go down and take a look at what's going on? I have a heart for the Lord. I want to see people love him. So from verses, uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 25, we see the evangelism of Samaria. And that means the whole area, I'm taking it, not just one town or one little village, but all of Samaria as he starts that. Now, Samaritans and, Judea, uh, and the Judeans are of the same family, right? They're, the Samaritans are half-breed Judeans, Judeans. So they didn't get along. They didn't have the same religion anymore because they split way back long ago, and that's a, a long historical talk uh, for another time. But they split long ago. There was some that said, let's stay in Jer let's Let's worship God here in this way. And Jerusalem said, no, let's stay with the true God and stick with that. And so there was a split. There was then animosity between the two of them. And they were constantly fighting and, and uh, struggling with each other. And they had nothing to do with each other. One would see it. That's why the Good Samaritan was, was a great example because it was a bad Samaritan who was good. And uh, so that was the example of that. So what we see is that Peter, Philip preaches successful sermons and saves the Samaritans. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the, mess, the Messiah. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, heard Philip first. Remember, we, we always said it was the preaching first and then the miracles, right? When he heard Philip and saw the signs performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Why? Because the miracles substantiated that he was from God. And they would listen and say, okay, this is the message. This is what we need to see. This is what we need to hear. Um, so there was a great and huge amount of people all around Samaria as he preached. He probably went from city to city, not just one city, preaching the gospel. And people would come, like Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham ceremonies, right? I mean, um, uh, crusades, that's the word I want. As he goes around from city to city in different uh, nations, people come drawn to him. And it's amazing watching them walk down the aisle and praying that those souls all meant it and wasn't just a, a hop on the bus, the, the going bus at the time seeing that. So there's this big success. People are being baptized. Uh, a man named Simon comes along. He's baptized. He believes in the Lord. These people believe in the Lord. They're baptized, but there's no signs. They call Peter and John. Why do they call Peter and John? Or why did Peter and John decide that they should get down there? Remember, in Matthew Matthew 16, 16, God gives Jesus, um, Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Samaritans' hearts were locked away. They weren't coming to the Lord. They didn't believe in Judaism and the one, and one God. 
Someone needed to come and unlock the door to the church. So down came Peter and John. They were buddies anyway. and They were working together. They had a plan. And they came down and opened the door to the church. And then the church started to show the same signs that they showed in Jerusalem. People, each one getting gifts that they were given, that they were given to do the work of the Lord and to share that God was a part of that work. So when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent uh, Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So now now the door was unlocked. Now the door was open. Though that key, Peter had, didn't just keep that key to himself. He unlocked and opened the door to another group of people. All, all the Jews were accepted, and the door was open on the day of Pentecost. Now there was a, another people group that was different. That were God's people. They were people that God had had uh, had taught and brought into and had gave, given the the six hundred and thirteen commandments, uh, the the same people who they were related to the Jews, but they had turned turned away, and now God says, "Let's open the door to them so that they can be a part of the church." So now we have the Jews and the Samaritans all together in one church. What an amazing thing! Peter and John opened the, uh, uh, brought the keys down. There's, let's talk about Simon the sorcerer a little bit because he's an interesting character. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Simon himself believed he uh, believed and was baptized. Simon himself believed and was baptized. You want to underline that maybe in your Bible? Uh, because that's important. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished. So Philip wasn't just staying in one city, right? He was going around from city to city. Uh, he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now remember, he is a great sign and miracle worker, right? He is a magician in, in the local area. When Simon saw the Spirit, when Simon saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. We all, um, we all know that story, right? We've read it. Now let's understand that Simon himself believed. That's what the Bible says. And was baptized. That's what the Bible says. Now, when... He asked Peter to give him the gift of giving gifts to other people. Peter blew up. If you remember, remember that story, go back and read it uh, in uh, Acts 8, 5 through 25. You'll see the whole story. But he, 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 Peter blew up and said, no, your, your money perished with you. That's a bad thing. Now remember when he did that to... Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, what happened? They died. When Peter blew up, they died. You don't want Peter blowing up on you. <clears throat> right? So uh, Peter uh, blew up on him, and what did he do? He said, oh, please pray for me so that these things that you're talking about don't happen to me. Once again, Peter has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He can open the doors and he can shut the doors. He can bind and he can unbind or free. And so he binds one more principle. You can't buy the gift of God. It's a free gift. It's open to anybody who wants it. But God is going to give it to you. So you can't buy it. It's there. That was locked now. All of a sudden, now no longer would anyone try to buy their way, or should anyone try to buy their way into the church, buy their way into gifts, buy their way into, into prophecies of any kind. They just simply accept the work of God, and God works through them. Humbly, 
And what happened with Simon the sorcerer, who was a great and proud man, he humbled himself and he said, you know, I can't even talk to God in this situation. I feel so bad. Please pray for me that none of this will happen. God always looks for humility. And that's why at the very beginning, Simon himself believed and was baptized means a lot. It was the belief that made him able to humble himself and say, I know that I have a great name. I'm famous. I am the Brad Pitt of Samaria. But I'm not great enough to talk to God right now. Would you talk to him for me? Let him know I'm very sorry. I, I didn't know. I didn't understand. And to understand that, you know this about the sorcerers. Sorcerers would go around looking for more magic tricks to play all their lives, right? The more m magic tricks they had, the better, the more powerful they looked, the more people believed in what they had to do. So uh, Simon was a sorcerer, and he was apparently a very great one. So he had traveled the world, probably seeing um, something that he'd never been able to do before and wondered how that was done. So he goes to the guy and offers him a, a few bucks and says, teach me how to do that trick. And so it was just part of his life. He was just being what he was. But God changed him by the power of the Spirit. And he became a humble man. Let's go on and, and read a little bit more. Acts 8, 26 through 40. The, the rest of the, the chapter. Read this event too because it's a strange one. It's a little different. Because when you're a Billy Graham, you want to go where people will be drawn to you. And taken to you. You want to go where thousands will gather because you're an evangelist. You want as many people to hear as possible. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We've heard of the Gaza Strip, right? We know that, so this is all part of it. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, or Candake, uh, which means queen of Ethiopia. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, so he was a proselyte, right? He was a person who had accepted God, Judaism. He was not a Jew, but he had accepted Judaism and became a follower of God, and that's why he would go to Jerusalem to worship on occasions, probably on the, all the different feasts he would go there and then special times he would want to go and he'd just get permission as the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia you know he could do whatever whatever he wanted and take a whole group of guys with him so this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and Philip catches up with him God told him, now this is strange, isn't it? God told him, I want to make sure I'm not going to, I'm not, yeah, okay. I, I didn't want to mess up, up my sermon. And Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. How nice, if you're going to evangelize somebody, it's nice to have them have the and be reading it and wanting to hear something from it, right? So many of us have to knock on the door and say, hey, do you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And they don't even care. Don't bother me with that. But this guy did care. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. Well, I just happen to be here to do that. Now, the interesting thing about it is he had just left a successful evangelistic crusade and God calls him and says oh, leave leave the uh, thousands who are coming 
I have one man for you to talk to. God cares about the one individual. And he cares about the thousands. Philip and John are there. You leave. You go down and see this man. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This passage, is the passage, this is the passage of scripture eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so, did, uh, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he, deprived, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from this earth. And we read that uh, and preached about it here while we were going through the prophecies of Jesus. A few weeks ago, uh, earlier this summer, uh, this this year, uh, we were preaching through the prophecies of the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus, and this one, this was the one that talked about Jesus' suffering. Who's he talking about? Himself or someone else? Well, he was talking about himself. Isaiah was talking about himself, but he was also talking about the nation of Israel. But he was also talking about. Jesus Christ, who suffered unjustly. And what a great place to start. Yeah, that's talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He came to earth, lived with us miraculously, did wonderful things, lived with us as a human being, experiencing everything the flesh experiences and then was killed for his teachings. Falsely killed for his teachings. But he did that. He surrendered himself so that you, riding here on the road to Gaza, on the road back home, you could hear this gospel, and you can accept him as Savior. For his life, Life was taken from this earth. He had no descendants. Then there's a strange thing that happens again. First of all, the strange thing was God interrupted his evangelistic outreach to go to one guy. Then he goes to this guy, and this guy is he's talking about Jesus and all this stuff. And where in the world does this guy get this idea? As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Now, some Bibles leave verse 37 out. Uh, I asked for it to be put in. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus, is the, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So this came out of, I'm thinking, out of his conviction, uh, uh, conviction of a proselyte. He was a proselyte. He understood that for a, for a, a proselyte to become a Christian, they had um, um, a Jew. They had to uh, be circumcised. They had to submit to and, and agree to the the six hundred and thirteen laws, and they had to be washed in a lot of water. And so he was saying, "Hey, if I'm going to change from Christianity uh, from Judaism to Christianity." There must be something that I want to submit to. I submitted to that as I came a, uh, became a Jew. Now I will submit to whatever Christ wants me to do. And Philip then says, yes, ooh, we, all, we all practice this. This is something that comes out of it. It may have come out of his teaching uh, as he talked about Jesus and, and Isaiah 53. But I think it kind of was laid on his heart that he wanted to respond. He had a love for this God. We showed it by coming from Ethiopian God, uh, multiple God worship to single God worship Judaism. And then when he met Jesus Christ, he would do anything to become a Christian, to submit. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The interesting thing is that defines baptism, doesn't it? 
What did he do? Did he go down in the water and get splash around a little bit? No, he went down into the water and then came up out of the water. We practice that in baptism. As we baptize everybody, they go down into the water and they come up out of the water. What? They come up out declaring that they're walking a new life. They're born again. They, the old is buried away under the water. And the new life comes out of the water. And so if anyone hasn't done that yet, that might be something you'd want to do. It, was, it came out of a devoted heart. Always having to believe first. Without belief, it means nothing. It's just getting wet. But with belief, it's identifying with Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's how the early church saw it anyway. And that is how Philip fulfilled his, his, commit, uh, his command from the day of uh, ascension when Jesus went to heaven. He said, go into all the world, teaching them to, become, uh, to believe, to become disciples, baptizing them. Uh, so that is an action that the evangelist does, the person does who presents Jesus Christ to that person and then rising again. It's not an act that you do to earn heaven. Something you some have you ever seen someone have you ever said to someone who was getting who who died and was buried boy he sure has to work to get his himself buried doesn't he no yeah it that's a, an act of submission completely so the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing why rejoicing because he had eternal life in his hands and he knew it. He knew the one God and he loved him with all his heart. He was drawn close to him and submitted to him. Philip did what he did because he loved God. The Ethiopian eunuch did what he did because he loved God. John and Peter did what they did because they were commanded to do that and because they loved the God who commanded them. What a great chapter this is in the book of Acts. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, there are hearts that want to have that same kind of relationship. I pray that you would bless us, that you would bless each one here and help us to live according to the, your word. Thank you for men like Philip who were just members of the body, but who had a compassion for people and who would preach the word in season, out of season, teaching thousands or just one about Jesus because he was concerned about their souls. Let us have that same passion and compassion. Draw us close to you, Father, mm -hmm. in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we consider our response to God? Draw me close to you, never let me.
never let me go. I lay it all down again. I hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. Nothing else can take your place. Feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. Sunday school this morning and it doubled. We had Joe and Jim in the Bible in the Sunday school this morning. So next week we need to double again. Two more people come join us at 9:30 on Sunday morning uh, before church. 9:30. So come and be a part of that. Love to have you here with us. However, I do understand. Yes, that if you missed that Bible study, there will be a Bible study after I get cleaned up in here. <laughs> Uh, after church, uh, we will be studying the book of Ruth, so we'll start in on chapter 1. Uh, now, we're meeting um, in a room that is not terribly visible to people who are going to their cars. It's well, on if the you want to meet in the fellowship hall, you can, but you can meet there where, where we're meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will meet wherever uh, people will gather. <laughs> okay. What? No, we meet. Uh, we meet in the prayer, in the prayer room. Yeah. So it's not as. Yeah. And so, if you want that room, that's there. This is room for six, seven, eight people. Uh, yes. So uh, my original plan was to use the same room okay. for Bible study. So Good. come around to the, uh, to the back of the building. I'll leave the door wide open so you can see it. Okay. Okay, and uh, John is leaving. John and Dina are leaving uh, on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. they, have, uh, they have to get to the airport before 11. What time do you have to get to the airport? Nine by nine? Seven? Ah, so anyone who can give them a ride would be appreciated. Otherwise, they have to pay Uber. And who wants to pay Uber or anything? Uh, so if, uh, if anyone can talk to them about getting them a ride, that would be wonderful. And then pray for them all the time they're going to be gone. They've got some stuff they have to do. Pray for Carol. Uh, she's got... Uh, medical procedure that needs to be done so for um, Joe Gray because he needs your prayers uh, his his uh, body is not joyfully accepting the new liver the liver is doing fine he is fighting it so pray that he stops fighting and accepts it as part of his body um, let's see who else Doug Earl and Linda uh, be praying for Earl because he has another. They're trying to figure out what the source of his pain is. So be no, praying for them as they it's do that. It's pancreatitis. He has pancreatitis. They did, they did find his um, 
yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, pancreatitis. Yesterday. Okay, a swollen pancreas, but they don't know why the pancreas is swollen. So uh, be praying that they can figure it out and find a way to fix it. Along with all of us, we all need some fixing, so pray for that too. And let's bow for prayer. Pat, would you mind having that prayer? Great and glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your love. Lord, we come to you lifting up those that are struggling with health issues, Lord. We pray, Lord, for your healing hand upon each one, on Michael, on Earl, on Carol, on each one that is struggling with health problems, Lord. You know each one's name. We ask your healing hand upon them. We ask your blessing on each person here and the families represented. We ask our lives would glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. I once was blind. I could not see. Chains of sin had shackled me. But God in heaven heard my plea. Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in the darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Now grace so sweet, you buzz my soul. loves you. Now I'm gonna 
Love. 